Day 157 of the war in Gaza. Qatari Egyptian mediation efforts to achieve a humanitarian pause in fighting before the start of Ramadan have failed. IDF operations to destroy Hamas are ongoing alongside efforts to ensure ample humanitarian assistance to the civilian population. More on this from ILTV's Steve Leibovitz. It's being reported that Marwan Issa, deputy to Mohammed Def, the number three of Hamas's high command, was targeted by an Israeli airstrike on Saturday. The IDF cleared the event for publication today. Issa was reportedly hiding in Nusirat in central Gaza at the time of the strike. It's unclear whether the Hamas leader was killed. Meanwhile, any hopes for a last-minute deal for a pause in fighting during Ramadan in exchange for Israeli hostages failed to materialize due to Hamas intransigence. Just before the start of Ramadan, Hamas is preventing a humanitarian ceasefire. Hamas is rejecting the proposal of the mediators. Hamas cares only about one thing, the survival of Hamas leaders. The IDF continues its ongoing efforts to confront and destroy Hamas, intense fighting focused on close-quarter clashes in the eastern Hamad area of Khan Yunis, where the Givati Brigade captured a cache of weapons at the Hamas hideout apartment building in the area. The troops seized mortars, explosive devices, assault rifles, and ammunition, where the IDF said Hamas used the high-rise towers for terror activity. Also in Khan Yunis, the Bislamach Brigade killed 17 gunmen and the 7th Armored Brigade killed several more operatives, including by calling in airstrikes. In central Gaza, the Nahal Brigade killed 13 gunmen over the past day, including with sniper fire and by calling in airstrikes and tank shelling. They also destroyed an underground tunnel route. While continuing the war, Israel is expanding efforts to facilitate unlimited aid into Gaza, overland, by sea, and through international airdrops. The army says that Hamas is trying to steal for itself. According to the IDF and ISA intelligence, Hamas has been stealing humanitarian aid and stockpiling equipment and food for Ramadan for Hamas terrorist leaders instead of the Gazan civilians in need. The army says that Hamas wants to escalate and not calm tensions during Ramadan. By refusing to release our hostages, Hamas is preventing a humanitarian ceasefire and increasing the suffering of the civilians in Gaza. Hamas wants only one thing, to escalate the Ramadan. And Sunday evening marks the start of the Muslim holy month of Ramadan as worshippers flocked to the Al-Aqsa Mosque on the Temple Mount for prayers. Over the coming month, the Temple Mount is expected to receive tens of thousands of Muslims daily, and Israel has said it will ensure freedom of worship for all, while ensuring continued security for Israelis. At the same time, Hamas has dubbed this month the Holy Month of Jihad and has openly called for violence against Israelis. ILTV's new correspondent, Raquel Savadi, is in Jerusalem with the latest. Raquel, what can you tell us? Thank you, Lidar. I'm reporting here from Jerusalem as yesterday was the first day of Ramadan. Last night, we already saw clashes between police and worshippers at the entrance of Al-Aqsa Mosque, the third holiest site in Islam. It lies on top of the Temple Mount, which is the holiest site in Judaism. Police and security officials have been with rising tensions as thousands of police have been deployed in the old city of Jerusalem. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has already reinforced that there will be freedom of worship and that the same amount of people that have prayed in the past years during Ramadan on the Temple Mount will be allowed this year with weekly reviews. Back to you, Lidar. Thank you, Raquel. And joining us now with more on the security situation in Israel on the first day of Ramadan is founder and director of Palestinian Media Watch, Itamal Marcus. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. So we are officially now in the month of Ramadan. Israel was hoping to have a hostage deal and temporary ceasefire secured during this month, but Hamas uh, has refused, you know, hoping instead to sort of ignite the region over this holiday. So I want to ask you, you know, what the word is on the Arab street? How are they viewing uh, these developments? Well, first of all, we have to look at what Ramadan uh, has meant over the years in the Palestinian Authority. And 
the best example, the best example of, of what this is in terms of terror is a uh, sermon that was given two years ago during Ramadan by the most important religious figure in the Palestinian Authority. He's uh, uh, Mahmoud al-Habash. He's Abbas's advisor on Islam. And in his sermon, um, he comes to the people and the Palestinian people, and he says, what did the prophet do in Ramadan? He says, did he spend it in serenity, laziness, and sleepiness? And he says, no, he was all the great battles he fought during Ramadan. Then he talks about the Battle of Badr, which he fought in the Ramadan. He conquered Mecca during the Ramadan. Um, and, and then he points out, he says, the prophet didn't say people are thirsty, they're tired, they shouldn't, fa they shouldn't fight now. No, they went in even though they were fasting. And then he comes to what all of this, uh, how, how what Muhammad did is a, is a role model for them. And then he says, Ramadan is meaning for Palestinians, what it was in the life of the prophet, a month of jihad, conquest, and victory. That's a quote. So you've got the top religious figure telling Palestinians that this is not a time for you to sit around and be tired because you're fasting or you're thirsty. You have to go out there, conquest, jihad, victory, meaning, if we translate into, into our words, this is a time for terror. Go out and kill Israelis. So this is coming from the top religious figure, Mahmoud Abbas's advisor on Islam. This was two years ago. This has been the atmosphere doing all of the years. And now just uh, so the a couple question, of weeks ago. That's, a, that's the question. I mean, yeah. That was two years ago. Now we're in the midst of a war in Gaza. Obviously, tensions are even higher. So what's happening now? Okay, so March 1st, what he did was he made a similar kind of speech. And he said, Ramadan will revive the faith and activity in and in our just jihad and our legitimate goals. So again, he's talking about this again. So the Palestinian Authority, like Hamas, are all trying to encourage their people. Uh, now, one of the reasons why it's going to be very hard for them, is Israel has arrested uh, over 4,000 terrorists in Judea and Samaria since October 7th. All of the terror infrastructures and suspected terror infrastructures that we knew about, that we were watching carefully, we decided to stop watching carefully and go in and arrest them. And that was the big change in Israeli, I would say, political uh, approach to terror in Judea and Samaria. The approach now is any kind of a question uh, of an organization, go out and get the people. And that's why we have, like I say, 4,000 people who we knew about primarily beforehand, and yet we were waiting, and now we stopped waiting, and we've arrested 4,000 people. Um, just to give you a sense of that number, before we started these arrests, we only had about 4,500 terrorists in prison. So we've almost doubled the prison population. I'm not talking about Gaza arrestees now. The, we've almost doubled the number of, of Palestinians arrested, terrorists arrested, and suspected terrorists um, in just the last few months. So what we did is we took away the chance of them doing something. Did we miss some people? Of course we missed people. There were probably hundreds, if not thousands, of terrorists out there who are still hiding. Uh, so I don't think there's going to be a systematic organized terror, but I, I fear we will have definitely have attempts at uh, terror. And the police are, of course, uh, on high alert for terror attacks. Uh, you know, thousands of police spread uh, out across Israel and in Jerusalem. Uh, and, you know, of course, we have to talk uh, also about the war in Gaza uh, this year. The IDF, uh, ready to go into Rafah, uh, you know, the question is, Will it be able to do so during Ramadan? What kind of effect will this have uh, on the Palestinians who, are, you know, in the in uh, Judea and Samaria who are already being incited uh, to terror? I mean, is it possible for Israel uh, to go into Rafah during Ramadan now, or will it further inflame uh, the tensions in the Arab world? I, I think that uh, the greatest deterrent uh, against Palestinian terror is for them to see that we are strong and we are confident and we are fighting and we are defeating them. Uh, every time we back up a step because of their threats and because of their warnings, they actually um, take confidence in this and we have more terror. We have seen so many times when the Palestinian Authority has listed, has called for, let's say, a strike or called for a day of rage, and they said these days of rages are effective, and then they list all the times when Israel has canceled uh, security plans uh, because of their threats of rage. So the answer is not to give in to their threats, to be strong. There is no greater deterrent against terror than to make the other side feel that we are strong and their terror will be useless and they will be killed for nothing. Absolutely. Itamar Marcus, thank you so much uh, for joining us today and providing your analysis. Thank you.
And Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has responded to U.S. President Joe Biden's criticism of his conduct of the war in Gaza. Insisting that most Israelis back his policies, Netanyahu said the majority of Israelis reject efforts to reward Palestinians with a state after October 7th. More from ILTV's William Sharon. Prime Minister Netanyahu responded to U.S. President Joe Biden's public criticism with strong public comments of his own. A statement from Netanyahu's office distributed the interview clip with Politico, stating in the title that Netanyahu was responding directly to Biden. Netanyahu blatantly rejected Biden's critique that he is hurting Israel more than helping by claiming that most Israelis back his politics and that the president was wrong. But if he meant by that that I'm pursuing private policies against the majority, the wish of the majority of Israelis, and that this is uh, hurting the interests of Israel, then he's wrong on both counts. Number one, these are not my private policies only. They're policies supported by the overwhelming majority of the Israelis. They support uh, the action that we're taking to destroy the remaining uh, terrorist battalions of Hamas. They say that once we uh, destroy the Hamas, the last thing we should do is put in Gaza, in charge of Gaza, the Palestinian Authority that uh, educates its children towards terrorism and pays for terrorism. And they also support my position that says that we should resoundingly reject the attempt to ram down our throats a Palestinian state. Netanyahu said that his politics in the Gaza war were backed by the majority of Israelis. Uh, the majority of Israelis understand that if we don't do this, what we'll have is a repetition of the October 7th massacre, which is bad for Israel, bad for the Palestinians, bad for the uh, future of peace in the Middle East. So the, the attempt to say that my policies are my private policies that are not supported by most Israelis is false. The vast majority are united as never before, and they understand what's good for Israel. Netanyahu's comments were a direct rebunk of the White House messaging unhappiness with Netanyahu while still giving strong support for Israel and highlighting alleged gaps between the Israeli people and their prime minister. Experience the power of truth with ILTV News. If you're looking for quality content and captivating visuals, join our news community and become an integral part of our team as we embark on a mission to unveil the real Israel, dismantling the web of lies and misinformation that surround reporting on Israel. By subscribing to ILTV News, you will not only have access to the latest updates, but you will also amplify our message, creating a ripple effect that carries the truth far and wide. Subscribe today and help reshape the narrative, available on the web, Android, and Apple. And UNRWA is supposed to be a Palestinian aid organization, but after October 7th, its deep ties to Hamas terrorists has come into the spotlight after its so-called aid workers were found to have even taken part in the massacre of Israelis, while thousands of its employees were found to have glorified the attack. And now in a first, a new lawsuit filed on behalf of families of October 7th victims is directly taking on UNRWA for its role on October 7th. Joining us now with more on this lawsuit is attorney and CEO of the International Legal Forum, Arsen Ostrovsky, who is part of the legal team taking this action. Arsen, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. So your organization's involved uh, in the lawsuit filing mm -hmm. on, on behalf of the families uh, of the victims of October 7th. What can you tell us about the lawsuit? I think first we have to put this in context. There can be no more ifs, buts, or maybes. UNRWA has become an inseparable and indistinguishable arm of Hamas. It has become an incubator for hate, incitement, and terrorism. There are those who say it's just a few rotten apples, but the fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is this organization has become rotten to the core and infested with terrorism, and we have to hold responsible not only the perpetrators Hamas, but those that enable and support them, like UNRWA USA, which is UNRWA's primary fundraising vehicle in the United States, which knowingly and systematically, despite the overwhelming evidence, continued to fund UNRWA and send them 3.8 million last year alone in donations. This is money that helped fund the massacre, the rape, the abductions and the torture of Israelis. And so what do the, the families of the victims, what do they hope to achieve with this lawsuit? Look, there's, there's a group of uh, survivors that are part of, this, um, part of this claim. Some are survivors of the Nova Music Festival. Some are families of uh, hostages like Lishai Levi, whose husband Omri has been held hostage uh, for over 150 days now. I think there's a couple of things. Uh, one, the families want some kind of semblance of justice. They want to make sure that the perpetrators are held responsible. They also want to make sure those that support, enable and fund and allow these kinds of crimes and on the ongoing captivity 
of Israelis um, to be held accountable for their actions as well. You know, we're seeing uh, in recent days Canada, EU, mm. other countries saying that they're going to resume uh, funding uh, for UNRWA, even though, as you mentioned, now its complicity in terrorism mm. uh, is, is quite clear. Uh, there was supposed to be a major investigation into uh, UNRWA, mm. into its ties to Hamas, ties to terror. What's happened with this investigation? I mean, where does UNRWA stand today? Look, first of all, asking UNRWA to investigate itself is like asking a pyromaniac to investigate the cause of a fire. Now, this investigation has not gone anywhere to date, and notwithstanding that, countries like Canada, like Sweden, and we can only presume others will follow, have said, you know what, we don't even have to worry about those investigations, which haven't even been carried out yet, but we're going to resume our funding. Now, this is a, a negligent decision. This is an awful decision that will only continue to perpetuate and continue funding the kinds of atrocities that we saw, and furthermore, the ongoing captivity of the hostages that remain captive in Gaza. You know, as, as we're speaking, uh, mm. just today, the UN Security Council has convened uh, after five months mm. uh, at the request of the United States, the UK, uh, and France to mm. discuss uh, the rape uh, that took place on October 7th, which the UN has finally uh, acknowledged. So mm. really, you know, you, you mentioned how can UNRWA investigate itself? How can Israel ever trust UNRWA again? How can any country trust UNRWA again after, you know, what's been revealed? Or the UN, for mm. that matter. Look, I mean, I think uh, no one can trust UNRWA ever again. And quite frankly, no one ought to have trusted UNRWA before this as well. You know, the, the explosive allegations that we saw in the last month about UNRWA staff being involved in the massacre itself, in the abduction, in carrying out these attacks, in holding uh, Israelis captive and hostage in Gaza. Now, as shocking as this was, it ought not to have been shocking because we've been saying for years and years that UNRWA is infested with Hamas terrorism. UNRWA is involved in incitement. They're involved in helping uh, cover up the rockets that are being stored there. So none of that ought to have come as any shock. UNRWA has no role to play in Gaza, no role to play in the Middle East. UNRWA only perpetuates the conflict that is part of the problem, not the solution, and it should be disbanded and defunded altogether once and for all. And, you know, on the one hand, some countries are resuming funding, mm. as we said, but on the other hand, uh, UNRWA is claiming that it's, uh, you know, threatening its own demise, sort of saying that it's about to run out of money. So, you know, where does UNRWA stand today in terms of its ability to continue its work? Um, look, I, I think UNRWA has ample money as we, as we um, at this particular point, and I think a, la a large part of it is UNRWA sort of uh, trying to... Uh, um, manufacture a much bigger crisis in terms of its funding than they really are in because the funding that has been paused to date is essentially future funding. They have money in the bank account uh, as we as we speak. It is a matter of priorities for them and we know their priorities include covering up for a lot of the crimes that Hamas uh, committed. Um, so they have sufficient funds but quite frankly those funds would be much better off going to the actual victims of the Hamas terrorism than perpetuating this ongoing conflict. UNRWA has become an impediment to peace. All they're doing is perpetuating this, um, this conflict, this violence, this ongoing relentless incitement. Uh, there are other agencies, other ways, other mechanisms through which you can get aid to the people of Gaza that really do need it and not in the hands of Hamas. And of course through this lawsuit uh, mm. Hopefully UNRWA will be held accountable uh, for its actions on October 7th. Arsene Ostrovsky, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And moving on, fierce cross-border exchanges are continuing between Israel and Hezbollah. In the latest fighting, three Hezbollah operatives were killed following a bombardment of Mount Meron. This as IDF exercises were underway in preparation for a potential ground operation. More from ILTV's Steve Leibovitz. The IDF struck a rocket launcher in southern Lebanon from which dozens of rockets were fired by Hezbollah at Mount Hermon. Another rocket launcher in Kunin used to fire dozens of rockets earlier at Mount Miron was also struck. Some 37 rockets were fired from Lebanon at the Mount Miron area. Many of the rockets were intercepted by Iron Dome or fell in open areas. No injuries were reported in the incoming bombardments. Earlier, five Lebanese were reported killed in an Israeli airstrike in Kirbit Selm. Hezbollah announced that three of them were members of the terror group. The IDF confirmed that it struck a building in Kirbit Selm where it said several Hezbollah operatives were spotted a night earlier. The IDF also confirmed it struck Hezbollah infrastructure and an anti-tank missile post elsewhere in South Lebanon.
Israeli leaders have repeatedly said that an IDF operation in Lebanon may be required to halt Hezbollah attacks. The IDF announced that over the past week, they have carried out logistics supply drills as part of its preparations for a potential ground offensive in Lebanon. And last night marked one of the biggest nights in Hollywood, the Oscars. And as celebrities walked down the red carpet, what was most not noticeable was not their fancy evening gowns and tuxedos, but rather their silence, silence on the hostages, which in itself spoke volumes. And joining me now with more on Hollywood's big night is ILTV's Devo Klein. Devo, so we saw a star-studded event, many people watching from home from around the world. Nobody said a word. Right. Um, I think that one of the reasons that we even hold the Oscars to this type of standard is because we just had the Grammys where we had artists like Montana Tucker sporting this big yellow ribbon and just being so vocal. We had a tribute to the um, those who were uh, murdered in the Nova Music Festival. And we've seen this from Hollywood and the Oscars just couldn't follow up. They, they, it's such a big event and they couldn't spare even a minute to mention the 134 hostages that have been captive and are still captive in Gaza. It's so heartbreaking. But we did have a director, uh, you know, renouncing his Jewishness uh, or some nonsense like that. We didn't see any yellow pins, but we did see plenty of red hand pins uh, distributed uh, by the group Artists for Ceasefire. These pins actually represent a very sort of horrific, uh, they have horrific symbolism. I mean, what can you tell us about the origins of, of this symbol? Right, um, so the pins are, it's, it's so tragic, the, the fact that artists can't see this. If they can, I have nothing to say, but a lot of them don't know that the symbolism of the red bloody hand, it comes from the Ramallah lynch in 2000, where two Israeli soldiers by mistake made a wrong turn into Ramallah when they were detained by authorities there. A mob heard of the story. They came into the police station and they brutally massacred and mutilated their bodies. And the sign of the bloody hand, it's something that I don't think that Western culture really grasps. It's something that is very, um, it's very violent and it's resistance and it's revenge and it's, it's horrible, honestly. And essentially it represents the murder of Jews, of Correct. Israelis. Uh, and I really have to ask, you know, do all those wearing the red pin at the Oscars, do they even know, uh, you know, what it truly means? And if not, now that they do, and I'm sure they'll hear about it, will they apologize for it? Probably not. Probably not, but I sure hope so. All right, Devo, thank you so much of for course. the update. Uh, Hollywood has been hijacked by pro-Hamas sympathizers, and the rest of Hollywood simply chooses to remain silent when it comes to the hostages. You know, when Boko Haram kidnapped the girls, every celebrity from Michelle Obama to Emma Watson raced to post a photo with, you know, the sign that called to bring our girls back home. But when Israeli women are kidnapped by Hamas, who share the same ideology, absolute silence. And silence, as we know, only encourages evil to spread. So how shameful for Hollywood to be complicit in this. But uh, moving on now to some good news. Uh, Israel's song for the Eurovision Song Competition has finally been revealed for the second time. On Sunday night, Israel unveiled its revised submission for the song competition after its first song, October Rain, was perceived to be problematic due to its reference to the October 7th Hamas terror attack. To stay in the competition, Israel changed its song to a new one, Hurricane, which is an emotional song about a young girl going through a personal crisis. We wish Eden Golan the best of luck in this year's competition. And now let's take a look at the weather forecast. Clear skies are expected tonight around the country with temperatures sitting at lows of around 11 degrees Celsius or 52 degrees Fahrenheit. Then tomorrow, sunny skies and warm temperatures are set to reach highs of around 24 degrees Celsius or 77 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's all for today's news. For more updates from Israel on all your devices, check out our ILTV channel, subscribe to our ILTV newsletter, and don't forget to check out our new and improved website, ILTV. TV with all the latest news from the heart of the state of Israel. I'm Madar Gravelazi. Be well, stay safe, and thank you so much for watching.